want to take a few minutes just to talk about the discussion question on UAS classification. So I think everybody had a pretty good handle on it, but there was a little bit of confusion, which was the whole idea of the question is just to show you how we are not standardized and we're closer, but we're not exactly there. So let's talk about the military first and let me give you a little bit of background. So prior to the current group system that we have is every branch of the Air Force on unmanned aircraft had what they called tiers. And you can kind of see by some of the nomenclature here on this chart that, you know, the Air Force used a tier NA all the way from tier one to tier three, but then you had a tier two and a tier two plus. Uh, the Marine Corps had a tier NA and then one, two, and three, and then the Army had just tier one, two, and three. So uh, not even standardized between the branches of the service. So kind of give you a good idea because you may see this in the future that you may see a contractor or an RPA uh, request for proposal uh, come out and it may define a system as tier one or tier two. You'll have to look and see which branch of the service it is and then go in and figure out going, oh, okay, uh, this is the aircraft that they're looking for uh, on some of that information uh, in order to complete the contract or even to bid on it. So uh, a little bit more, you know, we get into tiers, we talked about it. And like I said, previously to this group, you know, if you look on this slide, tier two is actually a predator. A tier two plus is a global hawk. And then you get into tier three, which is RQ-170, which is smaller than the Global Hawk. So it's like, well, wait a minute, which one is which? Uh, and then down below, we notice that we get into small micro UAVs. We have low altitude, long endurance. A lot of you brought up about the medium altitude, long endurance, the males, M-A-L-E's, or the hails, which are high altitude, long endurance. And you can kind of see where this is getting confusing in the military. So what the Department of Defense or DOD did was said, okay, we got to get everybody on the same page. And this graphic is a little bit different than the one that was in the uh, supplemental materials on the, on the roadmap for the DOD. But you can see the, the military came out with groups. So they have group one through five. And what really defines the group is the weight of the vehicle, uh, the operating ceiling, or usually their max altitude and then on the first three groups is speed so if you notice group one is from zero to 20 pounds they operate typically less than 1200 feet above ground level and their airspeed is less than 100 knots so you go to group two which is the scan eagle uh, it falls into 21 to 55 pounds less than 30 500 feet AGL above ground level and the airspeed is less than 250 and then you can see group 3, group 4 and then group 5 above that so uh, some of the things but also on this chart here's where it gets a little confusing again so even though I have groups they also refer to these if you notice in group 1 is also a micro mini tactical unmanned aircraft system uh, the group 2's are small tactical group 3's are tactical group 4's are persistent and then group fives are penetrating. So once again, they, they kind of add a little bit more nomenclature. And then if you look at the far left side, they even break it down to where group one and twos are considered small UASs now, so they're smalls. Uh, and then group three and above is what they call strike capable. And typically that means that they're able to carry some type of weapon system uh, for use in combat. And then on top of that, if you look over in the far right side where you see that U.S. Navy UCAS, which stands for Unmanned Combat Aircraft System, you may also hear them referred to as UCABS, which is Unmanned Combat Aircraft Vehicle. So you can kind of see where this, where this is going. So uh, they're trying to get standardized. They're working on it, but uh, they've got a long way to go. For those who've been in the military, uh, this is no surprise. The only thing I want to talk about is then this is the civilian side of the house. So typically the uh, FAA did not follow the military's lead on groups because um, there's really no need to uh, on some of these. So I pulled this off the FAA.gov backslash UAS website. And this has to do with registration. We'll talk about this later on when we get to, to regulations. Um, 
the interesting thing about this, about two weeks ago, the FAA was defeated in court, so you no longer have to register your civilian drone uh, or RC aircraft if you're a hobbyist or for recreational use. But notice how they define this. So if it's less than 250 grams or 0.55 pounds, we didn't have to register it. Typically for, for children uh, flying a little remote control helicopter, uh, it didn't need to be registered. But if it's above the 0.55 pounds, all the way up to 55 pounds, 25 kilograms, then it had to be registered. So uh, the 55 pounds is going to come into uh, what the uh, some regulatory issues here. So back in 2012, like I said, we're going to get to this more in regulations, but the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2012, Congress came up and gave them some guidelines on weights and some things to do. And the FAA uh, eventually came up with, or actually the regulations turned into what they call Part 107, Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems, basically regulations. Now out of that Part 107 is where we came up with these uh, remote pilot certificates or uh, so you're allowed to fly commercially in the national airspace system. The FAA also put out an advisory circular. So you'll hear this referred to as AC 107-2. And advisory circular is just that. It's advisory. Uh, it builds upon the Part 107 regulations and gives us some additional information. So in this case, it talks about small and manned aircraft in this 4.2.6. Uh, so it's section 4. 2.6 is a unmanned aircraft or a UA weighing less than 55 pounds including everything that's on board or otherwise attached to the aircraft and can be flown without the possibility of direct human intervention from within or on the aircraft so it means nobody's in it nobody's on it uh, but notice the language here so it's less than 55 pounds so really if I'm going to go fly under part 107 and I'm going to go make money as long as my vehicle, which is fully loaded with cameras, equipment, uh, batteries, fuel, if I'm using an internal combustion engine, weighs less than 55 pounds, I am legal. So this almost meets the criteria for a small UAS, which is anything in the group one or group two for the military, except they're good to 55 pounds. So if I want to fly an aircraft heavier than 55 pounds, I've got to go through a whole different process, which is called a Certificate of Authorization, also known as a COA. You have to apply for this. Uh, the FAA will probably require that you have a pilot's license. They're going to probably put some additional restrictions on you, on where you can fly, what you have to do to fly, like filing NOTAMs, notices to airmen, uh, you name it. Uh, they could require additional personnel, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we get into regulations. So really for us, anything less than 55 pounds uh, is considered a small UAS in the eyes of the FAA, and we can fly in the national airspace system. So hopefully I didn't confuse you any more or any less, and hopefully this cleared a few things up. But when we start talking military and civilian, you can see where there's quite a bit of difference and so far we have not really come up with a good way to define uh, you know small amount of aircraft other than being less than 55 pounds.